Okay, so thank you very much everybody um, for joining us. Um, sorry about the problems with the, the last session um, and the, the Zoom difficulties, but a huge thanks to our speakers for all agreeing so kindly to, to commit to doing this again another Monday. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Mary Sinclair from uh, Social Enterprise Network Scotland, also known as Sense Scott now. Um, just in case I get thrown off with broadband problems, my colleague Jude Reid, um, the sports scene coordinator here and can, will take over if there's any problems, but hopefully not. So this afternoon's session is focusing on flexible working and mental wellbeing. And just to say a, a, a wee bit, um, uh, a couple of things just to help the session go smoothly before we, we go on to the, the session. Um, really just to say that um, if you're not speaking, if you could mute your microphone, um, just to raise your hand if you want to speak, either virtual or on screen. And um, we're not going, but we are keeping this to an hour, this session, so we'll not have time for uh, round group introductions, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the, in the chat or if there's anything you want to add. And just to um, mention again there for anybody who's just joined, we are recording the session. Okay, and lastly, just to highlight that this is our wee disclaimer, I feel as if it's worded so nicely, right? Just to highlight that this session is intended as peer support and to enable sharing best practice. It's not a professional advice session. That's not to say that our three speakers are not highly professional though, okay? Um, so in terms of why we're hosting this session, uh, one of the key themes that came from the Social Enterprise Reset Week that we had held in May, which seems a lifetime ago, was a huge concern about the impact of COVID-19 on people's mental health and well-being and whether that was around people who are accessing their service, the communities that they work with, but also, and really crucially for a lot of social enterprises, it was about their workforce. So we wanted to um, hold some sessions that had their focus on workforce. So in July, we had a session uh, with Johnny Kinross from Grass Market and Helena from um, Bridge and a Gap in the Rural Partnership. Um, came along and spoke about some of the ways that they were supporting the mental well-being of their workforce during lockdown in the early stages and we also held a session on employers legal responsibilities around it. So this session really follows on from that and is really looking to explore about flexible working just as one of the ways that staff can be supported as we move if we ever move eventually from phase three towards phase four of the route map. And a huge thanks to Claire from the Melting Pot, who you'll be hearing from later, for coming up with the idea for this session. And just, I mean, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear when Claire talks uh, later just how convincing and passionate um, that, that she is around the, the really strong role that the sector can play in this, but how it's absolutely crucial that their, the organisations are supporting their staff. So, in getting started, we've got three speakers today. We've got Lisa Gallagher from Flexibility Works, who's going to give us an overview around flexible working and the benefits of it for both individuals, for employees, and also for the organisations. We'll then be hearing from Jeff Lisk from Young Enterprise Scotland. So they are an organisation who have implemented and really explored flexible working. So he'll talk a bit about some of the benefits that they've found for that and a bit about the process and some of the challenges, I'm sure, as well. And then we'll hear from Claire Carpenter at the Melting Pot, who's going to talk about co-working as one, as one way to um, enable flexible working. So each of them will speak for roughly about 10 minutes. I'm sure we'll have a, there'll be an opportunity to ask a couple of questions at that point, and then we'll finish off with a sort of Q&A session at the end, if that sounds fine to everybody. All good? Okay. So I will just pass over straight now to Lisa to get us started. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, Mary, and hello, everyone. It's really nice to be along here today and to join you all. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lisa Gallagher, as Mary said, co-founder of Flexibility Works, and we're a social business. We're supported by the Scottish Government and the Hunter Foundation. And for the past four years, I have lived and breathed flexible working. We support employers in a really practical way to embed a more flexible working culture in their organisations. 
Um, and really I got into flexible working. I was, I've worked in the third sector and the private sector are limited to be the third sector for most of my career. And when I had my first baby five years ago, um, I was running an organization and I'd hoped to come back on a job share basis. Um, but that wasn't meant to be. And at that point, I felt really upset and frustrated about, you know, how can we be more creative about keeping, in this case, more you know, senior women um, in roles while they balance their home life and their work life, if we're not a bit more creative about how we design work. So that's how I got into this whole flexible working world. And I've been living and breathing it, as I say, for um, about four or five years now. So today, what I want to talk about is a little bit about the flexible working landscape just now in Scotland just to set the scene a little bit before Jeff um, and Claire talk and now why it's more important than ever that it's something that should be at the top of our organization's agenda and how it's so closely linked to our mental health and well-being and therefore the well-being of our organizations um, and then I'll share a few top tips about managing your team's well-being in a more flexible working world if that's okay. So I guess the business benefits of flexible working have long been known. When people have more control over their home and work life, they're happier, we're more engaged, we're absent less, and we're more productive. And we know about you know, the business benefits about things like cost savings, improved service, better employee, work-life balance, attracting diverse talent, and having greater business resilience. Certainly, businesses pre-COVID that were more flexible have told us that they've had a much smoother transition to lockdown because they had a lot of the policies and practice and culture in place already. And flexible working has a close link to mental health, I would say, both from a preventative measure and also as a solution when people are experiencing poor mental health. So flexible working as a preventative measure, it reduces stress. It gives people time to do the things that matter to them. It gives us all a bit more time to look after family, care for relatives, see friends, and at a basic level, do stuff like cook a healthy a meal or have some time for exercise. And all of these things are good for our, our mental well-being. And flexible working helps to enable a lot of this stuff. The opposite of this is work without flex, and this be, can be the cause of mental ill health. So as a solution for managers, flexible working can be one solution to mental health and well-being. When someone is experiencing mental health problems, and a manager is looking to support, flexibility can be part of that plan. Now, of course, flexible working needs to be part of any mental um, health and wellbeing strategy, but there's no point in having initiatives like mental health first aiders and Friday yoga if there's no flexibility in place, I would argue. So when I talk about flexible working, it's about having a bit more control over where, when, and how long you work. It could be part-time, job share, term time working, but it could also be something as simple as a small adjustment to the start and finish times. I always think about an employee that I, I met at Lloyd's Banking Group who for him flexible working was 10 minutes. 10 minutes of flexible working made all the difference to him because his train going home left on the hour every hour and he wanted to leave at 10 to five to get home in time to read his um, son a story and put him to bed rather than waiting for the next train at six o'clock and he would miss that. So for him, that was 10 minutes. And if you've got flexible working, it doesn't mean that you're less committed about your career or that you don't work as hard. In fact, all the research will tell us when you have it, you tend to give back much more to your organisation. So what's flexible working like um, just now? Well, pre-COVID, well, pre-COVID, 75% um, of us in Scotland either had or wanted flexible working. Um, it was already in high demand and 90% of us who had flexible working said it had a positive impact on our well-being. And it's not just for mums, I think that's quite an outdated view now. Um, a growing body of research tells us are just looking around in our organisation that this is really something that everybody wants to make use of. So it's for younger people who might want to work at times of the day that best fit when they're feeling productive and energetic or it's for older people pre-retiral who are looking to um, start, start taking some time back for themselves, moving towards that phase of full, full retirement. It's for people with caring responsibilities, people with a disability. I read a lovely article on the BBC website a couple of weeks ago um, by a woman who is a wheelchair user and she said, I feel like I've never been more productive in my work during lockdown because I didn't have to 
um, travel into an office space every day. And for me, that was quite physically painful and tiring to do that. So for her, she feels like she's given back more to her organisation during that time. Or it's just for people who want more of a work-life balance. But there was still definitely a blocker there by many people who said flexible working wasn't possible or who were scared to manage people in more flexible ways. And then, of course, we all experienced the world changing dramatically as we all went into lockdown. So at the, at the height of the pandemic, 49% of all UK workers were entirely home working. Um, and in Scotland, pre-COVID, that was about 30%. So you can see the difference there during the last um, number of months. And during this time, we've had a, we've basically had an, a kind of mass home working experiment. Now, home working is only part of flexible working, but a, a mass home working experiment which has proven to many people and many naysayers that home working and flexible working more generally can be effective. And we've, we've heard from, I mean, we speak to employers all the time and we've heard from countless managers and employees who've had a complete mindset shift regarding home and flexible working during this time. And we've seen home working cynics become home working champions. I spoke to a partner at KPMG um, a few weeks ago who was a self-confessed uh, flexible working dinosaur, as he put it. He said he used to wear a shirt and tie and go into the office every day and thought it's nine to five is the only way. And he says, I can't believe how much, you know, my perception has changed. He said, I've got grown up children, but now I've got time to go out and go for a run in the morning. You know, I'm around my house more. I can contribute more to, you know, getting the washing done or at lunchtime, you know, hanging up with the washing, whatever it is. He says, and it's just more comfortable. It saves me so much time. So he said, I feel like I've turned into a flexible working um, champion. And I think that when we've seen flexible working, good flexible working in place during lockdown, it's really assisted with people's well-being and has not caused significantly more stress. It's helped alleviate stress. So looking beyond COVID, what we know is that 44% of UK workers, that's more than 13 million people, plan to ask their employer for changes to their long-term working pattern and for many that will mean a request to work more flexibly more often than before so this is something that's definitely not going away and something that we need to be thinking about as part of our kind of strategic plan as well as our operations um, and we do a lot of employee insight work in our day-to-day -day work we go into businesses and organizations and talk to employees about what was working before what wasn't working what are some of the barriers to flexible working and how can we implement more of that and people definitely cite their own mental health and well-being as the main motivating factor for looking for more flexible and home working. So those two things correlate very closely in people's minds. And when people are happy and content, you know all of us already, <laughs> they're less stressed and will go the extra mile for you and for the organisation. So as leaders, and I'm sure you're doing this already, is I would really be encouraging you to talk and listen to employees, particularly just now about what they're looking for and how it looks to their own mental health and well-being and therefore their happiness and productivity at work. So working at home during lockdown has been hard um, for all of us in our own different ways. Um, many people have had children at home. I've got three little ones under the age of five at home. So there's challenges around childcare and balancing two people working. Some people have been out of work. Some people have been in flat shares where space has been an issue and some people have felt quite alone and isolated. But many people have had greater opportunity to flex the times and days of the week that they work. And when this has been the case, employees tell us this has been better for them and their well-being and has helped to take some of their stress away. Managers have learned to start trusting their teams a little bit more to manage their own workload. And they've realised they don't have to have what's essentially presenteeism or to see someone in front of them to know that they're working hard. And I think flexibility during lockdown has kind of brought about lots of different, you know, positives. So I talked about that KPMG partner who said, you know, I was a dinosaur and now I've realised the benefits, you know, I get to exercise and so on. But I was speaking to a woman in a large, who works for a large third sector organisation the other week, and she made an interesting point. She said because she's been able to flex the times of the day in which she works around her family life, she's been able to pick up more paid work, which has been really helpful for her family financially and it's also given her organisation a greater resource so one of her stresses was financial instability but having flexibility over when she's worked for her has actually helped her well-being in that she's been able to bring in more money to support her family 
However, what I would say is one potential pitfall, as where some of us are, or probably all of us are potentially aware of as well, is overwork and that kind of decreasing distinction between home and work life. You know, that discipline that it takes to shut down your laptop and go, right, okay, my working day is finished. So keeping a close eye and avoiding overwork in teams is something for us all to be aware of. So I just want to finish by sharing seven um, tips, top tips for good practice for home and flexible working, which um, will help to keep well-being at the heart of our business practice. We did a little bit of work with Birkbeck University of London. So this was something that came out of that. And there's, they've got a really nice well-being guide, actually, that I'd be happy to share with um, the link with Mary to share with the group. So there's some really nice practical stuff in there. But the first top tip is, first of all, looking after yourself. This, this is not rocket science, I don't think, but it's sometimes nice to remind ourselves of it. It's look after yourself and role model behaviours for others within your team. So, for example, having a clear working space and a routine to your day making sure we have clear start and end points to our days, avoid that temptation to, oh, you know, you're walking past your laptop in the kitchen and pick it up and just say, I'll do another half hour, I'll do a half an hour, be disciplined and turn that off. And also think about what you need to be healthy. Is that a walk in the middle of the day or is that a run? What is it that makes you feel healthy and well at a time that suits your routine? Because your routine and behaviours have a big, big impact on others and living and breathing a healthy work style gives others the confidence to do the same. My um, partner in crime at Flexibility Works, Nikki Sloe, she's a really great advocate of this. So she might phone me up in the morning and say, right, I'm just taking the dog for a walk. It's quarter to nine. I'm just going out, getting some fresh air and I'll be on at quarter past nine or I'll be on at half past eight or whatever it is so that I know exactly what she's doing and when she's available and that she's doing something that will make her day better. And it makes you feel like, right, okay, if I want to go for a run during the middle of the day, that's okay to do that because this is how we operate as a team and as an organisation. So it's look after yourself first and role model for others. The second thing in terms of flexible working specifically is that um, a personalised approach and avoiding a one size fits all is preferable. So I would say as far as it's possible to do so, enable each team member to decide on the best hours of working for them during this time and communicate where possible only within these times. So we're avoiding the situation where someone might be starting earlier because it suits them but they feel like they've got to work on to fit in with someone else's schedule. Um, but of course teams still need to check in with each other so there'll be set times in the week or the day for teams to meet and collaborate so when is the best time for your team to do that. The third thing is focusing on the individual within the team Research tells us that remote working requires more communication, over communication in some respects with a greater individual approach. So this helps us to pick up issues quickly and have more personal connections. So I was speaking to someone in a law firm the other week and they've actually got a very structured approach to this. So they've got um, certain reports that they will call around and check in with every week to say, you know, are you okay? Do you need help with anything? How are things at home? How's your workload? Is there anything that I can help with? And they also keep, a, they've got timesheets obviously in, in the legal sector and they keep a check on who's logging higher hours consistently to check in to say, right, okay, is there a reason for that? Is it just a busy spell or is there something else that you might need help with to help avoid that burnout? So that's focusing on the individual. The fourth thing is acknowledging the difficulties and challenges. So we've heard a lot during this time, I think about greater empathy within leadership. Sir Tom Hunter was speaking at something a month or so ago and he, and he was talking about the importance of kindness in leadership which is underrated and should be talked about more and this is about I guess bringing your whole self to work and feeling like you're able to have honest conversations with your line manager and with your colleagues about you know how are things going and the need to work together and recognizing that this is a learning process for all of us. This is, this is really new stuff for a lot of teams and a lot of organizations. The fifth thing is all about trust and shifting the focus to outputs, not necessarily hours worked. So, I mean, a big foundation of all of this is trust and communication, but most people want to do a good job, right? So this is shifting our mind from hours worked to jobs that need to be done and supporting the team to get those jobs done and being super clear on what everyone is working towards. What are the individual objectives? Is everyone clear what I have to do? And what are the team objectives? And is everyone collectively clear about what needs to happen and by when and to what, to what quality? 
And the sixth thing is about the types and forms of communication that we use. So over communicating, checking in, calling, video conferencing and so on. But it's also agreeing and sharing with the team what methods of communication you will use and for what type of situation. So, for example, team chat or Slack for project focused chat, email for formal conversations and clients works and then video calls or phone calls for checking in and informal um, communication. Some people have certain preferences too. I've got someone um, in my team who really prefers video calls rather than phone calls. I would usually just pick up the phone and she said, I would really prefer you to, to video call me so I can see you and it feels like we're more in an office. So that's what we do together. So what are your team, team preferences? And the last thing I guess is about informal communication and interaction. Again, through our employee engagement work that we do within organisations, almost um, on every occasion, it's the social interaction that people are missing most about not being in the office. I think we often see non-work conversation as a bit of chit chat or gossip, you know, and potentially it takes away from the real work. But this is often the glue, I think, that hold, holds teams together. So it's thinking about how we kind of bring that social element into our remote working without it being slightly forced or you know cheesy in that respect but I think we've probably all done the weekly quizzes weekly drinks coffee morning drop-in so it's continuing to think quite creatively about what are the things that our team needs to keep that social interaction together is it walking meetings if we can do that in twos or small groups what is it that our team needs to stay connected so just to end, I would say, yep, there are challenges here, but there's also real opportunities for us all to be building on the flexibility we've learned already that we can now manage and keeping well-being and work-life balance at the heart of all of our teams and organisations. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was an amazing overview and lots and lots to take in. And um, I'm sure everybody would love to have a look at that, the, the wellbeing guide that, that you mentioned as well. We can share that on. Um, so just before we go on to Jeff, um, I think we've got time just quickly for one question for Lisa just now. We can come back to more questions at the end. But anybody got a burning question that they don't want to lose right this minute? Nope. Right. Okay, Jeff, we're straight over to you. There we go. That's me unmuted, and uh, I'm delighted that you uh, made reference to me in your opening slide because you accept no responsibility for any errors, Mary. So uh, you must be, you must have been on one of my presentations before. Uh, now, if I can manage to uh, share screen well, let's see there. Do, 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 do. hopefully that has come through and somebody will give me a thumbs up to say yay or nay thank you very much uh, mary uh, and thank you very much to uh, lisa for the first uh, session as well lisa somebody who i've known for uh, some time and uh, has probably been uh, one of the key reasons uh, why uh, young enterprise scotland has uh, developed uh, uh, some of the, the methodologies of, of working that, that we have uh, within the organisation. Uh, it's uh, my, my name is Jeff, uh, Jeff Leesk, and I, I'm very privileged to be the chief exec at an organisation called Young Enterprise uh, Scotland. And uh, Young Enterprise Scotland uh, is a charity, it's a third sector organisation and it has been a charity since uh, 1992. So uh, another another couple of years, and then we'll have our uh, whatever make that makes. That, does that make it the 30th anniversary? So uh, do 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 it. Uh, there we go. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about why flexible working is very, very important to us at Young Enterprise uh, Scotland. Uh, I, I've been at the organisation uh, since uh, 2013 when I joined uh, to take on the development and uh, implementation of a, of a programme to work in uh, FE sector, the college for the education sector. And uh, I, I took over as chief exec in uh, 2014. 
in, in terms of the the organisation and it, and its scale uh, and its makeup of uh, the the team, uh, it, it's a relatively small team. Uh, we have, I think, currently about twenty one uh, or twenty two uh, members of the team, uh, most of whom. Uh, they work a variety of, of hours uh, and uh, in a variety of locations. Uh, they also uh, have a very uh, broad uh, demographic in, in terms of what people might say. We, we're not a, an organisation where we have everybody who has a, a degree. Uh, we are not an organisation uh, where we have uh, everybody has has been uh, very well educated. It's a very very broad demographic in, in terms of education as well. And uh, the the other thing about the organisation is that we we have a Scotland wide coverage uh, through through our team. So we we have members of the team in Fife, uh, Ayrshire, Edinburgh, Lanarkshire. And uh, predominantly, the majority are, 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 are Glasgow or West, West Coast based. But we, we also have uh, uh, around about 600 volunteers across Scotland, and we very much count them as being part of our Scotland wide uh, coverage. We, we pride ourselves in being very much a, a values based organisation, and we've, we've tried to keep our uh, both the uh, development of, of those values the implementation of those values and the living of those values. We've tried to keep it uh, very, very uh, simple. Uh, we, we have four values. We don't get overly complicated with more than that. Uh, they're one word values and uh, they're pretty much embedded in everything that we do. So for example, we were undertaking interviews last week for a, a new role. And all of the all of the interview questions are based around about our value set. The, the other thing I wanted to say around about flexible working is that, and and, it, and this is probably a, a, a tip uh, for later on, is that we we're all, we're very transparent uh, around about uh, flexible working, uh, and we also have a one hundred percent belief. Uh, in in that flexible working uh, methodology uh, and and the process for somebody to uh, take up a, a flexible working uh, uh, sort of system for themselves. So the the, the how of flexible working uh, and uh, the reason why we have it is uh, very much uh, important that, and I think I probably mentioned this already, that we, you have buy-in from the team and uh, you also share the story about flexible working and the reasons why you have implemented the, the flexible working. I've said already that we, we very much need to have it on a, it, it, it has to be uh, promoted in a transparent way and that if if somebody is is uh, seeking uh, you know a flexible working arrangement, uh, uh, Lisa mentioned that that one earlier around about the ten minutes, and, and and I would I would endorse that wholly that you know ten minutes can make a huge difference to somebody. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a massive shift in 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 their their working arrangements, but it has to be a transparent process. Uh, and also, we we, uh, we we take a very consistent approach uh, to that decision making. Uh, I, th I think the the other thing to say is that you know, if, if you're going from uh, not having a, a flexible working uh, you know, environment uh, to having that, it, it takes effort and energy. On, on behalf of the, the leadership within the organisation uh, and, and the leadership in the broadest sense of the organisation to, to make it work. And, and I think it's also important uh, in, in our situation where we are a charity uh, that we have uh, absolute support for that from, from our board of directors as, as well. Uh, that, that's vital. And I think that it's not something for us uh, that happens 
and then it's just a case of that's it done uh, and, and that, that's you there, you, you, you have a flexible working environment. It, it's, it's definitely not a tick box exercise. Uh, it, it's something that needs ongoing support, uh, ongoing uh, nurturing, and uh, also uh, building in some sort of way of, of gathering feedback from uh, people in the team as to the success and any glitches that, that there might be in, in terms of that uh, uh, flexible working approach. And, and it was interesting what, what Lisa said earlier around about the shift for an organisation such as ours, which was very much one which was uh, in the habit of, uh, of flexible working. When, when, when March the 20th came along for us, and uh, we, we all headed home, schools closed, colleges closed, and our centre at Rook and Glen closed. It, it was not a huge shift for us uh, that, you know, from, from the, the, the Friday through until the Monday, it was very easy for us. And, and, and we had already embraced uh, not just the technology, but the, the, the working practices around about that as well. But, uh, and, and, and Lisa mentioned naysayers already, and uh, I put that up there as as a challenge. And you know, it would be wrong of me to say that there will not be somebody somewhere who will uh, knock you back and 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 try and knock you down around about the adopt the adopting of a of a flexible working uh, environment. And and so it's it's a case of uh, don't let that put you off uh, because uh, that, that's natural and you're going to get something like that that happens. Secondly, uh, you know, th there will be occasions where it become, where, where a, a specific flexible working request is, is made and, and actually the organisation can't actually work with that in that particular way. So it's about uh, probably probably could rephrase that, it's about not saying no, it's about trying to find the right way uh, to, to work with that person to make sure that you can find the best uh, way to work with that individual uh, for the benefit of the individual and, and, and the organisation. And the third one is, is very much around about getting the language right. Uh, and and it, it's, it, it can be silly little things. Uh, I, I remember uh, and I don't know whether it was uh, Lisa or uh, her colleague uh, Nikki, who was at our offices at Rook and Glen, and I'll, I'll never forget that uh, one of one of my colleagues uh, said to when I introduced this colleague uh, to either uh, Lisa or Nikki, and I said this is uh, such and such, and, and that person said, "Oh, I'm I'm so and so. I I only work uh, part time here." And, and I'll never forget that it was either Lisa or Nikki said, Let, let's not use that terminology. You work flexibly for, for Young Enterprise Scotland to enable them to, to uh, achieve what they achieve. And, and the final challenge that I wanted to put in there was that as, as you, you know, make sure that you, when, when somebody new joins the team and we're going through a process of recruiting new people, and it's about how you ensure that new people as they become uh, part and parcel of your team, how you uh, develop their knowledge and understanding of the way that, that we work as an organisation in a flexible way, uh, because it's not, we can't take it as given that they have come from uh, that environment in the past. And that's me, you'll be, you'll be glad to hear. So I can just uh, click uh, stop sharing, uh, Mary, like that. hopefully go back uh, to no, there we go. Which Thank, is you, Thank you, Jeff. That, that was great. Um, just, I think it's been really useful to to see it from the perspective of one organisation and for, for folk to hear that. Um, I think we'll just we'll move on straight to Claire, right? And then just make sure we've got time for everybody, and then hopefully we'll have a wee bit of time for some questions at the end. So Claire Carpenter from the Melting Pot, go for it. Uh, I'm muting myself. Hello, everybody. 
Um, thanks for invitation to speak and for pulling this together. Um, just so that I've got a bit of a sense in the room, as it were, if you raise your hands if your team currently work, well, okay, let's have that. Pre-COVID, did your team work flexibly? Okay, and what about, did they work remotely pre-COVID? Oh, so there's a lot of, a lot of you were like in the office. Raise your hands if you were in the office. Okay, variety going on there. Um, how do we start this? When COVID happened and we all ran away to our burrows and um, some of us went on furlough and some of us didn't, the, it, the, the sort of the knock on effects of all of that are, are still being played out. You know, some people aren't back at work yet from being um, furloughed or any part time furloughed. And this conversation came about about like the, in, the impact of um, us, on our staffs, on their well being, on their future well being, on their future promotion uh, due to remote work. Um, it came up as conversation, I keep hearing it time and time again. In case you're not aware, one of the things, but not entirely, that the Melting Pot does is provide a co-working hub in the centre of Edinburgh for people to work flexibly. And we have people who are in the startup stage, we have um, consultants who've had their life working for other people and they've reached an age and stage where they're, they're willing to be a consultant and work, uh, working self-employed. We've got teams of people who are working for national organisations and their staff are coming from different places all over Scotland and they come in and they work from the melting pot for a day or half a day or, and that varies according to the team. So the melting pot has already been a vehicle to enable employers to uh, enable their team to work flexibly and to work remotely. It's not new to us. Um, what's interesting to myself and other co-working practitioners around the world is this sort of sudden revelation that seems to be going on that um, remote and flexible working and maybe different ways of working, not having an HQ office. This, uh, this is a, seems a surprise to people, whereas we've obviously been advocating it for years. And it's like, oh, finally, people are realizing they don't have to have that, their own office. Marvellous. <laughs> you can rent space and rent curation and rent community, access to community, but without having to put all of that infrastructure in and maintain that infrastructure yourselves. So I'm just going to tell you a few thoughts that have come through my mind and through the different conversations I've been having with different third sector leaders, entrepreneurs and co-working practitioners, people looking at workspace as an industry and providing that service. And hopefully some of what I say might be of interest to you. But if I start with what I know well, in 14 years of running the Melting Pot, uh, which is one of Europe's, not just Scotland, but one of Europe's first co-working hubs. So it's a really pioneering thing. We've um, proven that that way of working, enabling people to work flexibly, curating community around them, sharing knowledge, sharing resources, you know, it's far more than just an office. And any of you have ever been in there, well, it's a different vibe to the standard office. But what we've proven is that we increase the quality uh, we have a very 50-50 um, male-female um, audience in the space. That's not necessarily the case in other co-working hubs. Um, and part of the reason why we're increasing the quality is due to allowing people to work flexibly. They're only paying for an office one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, according to what they need. They can have it five days a week. But that enables people who are only working part-time to be able to afford a physical presence, a, a, phys a physical professional um, arena to work in. It gives them, um, yeah, it gives them show, a, a place to show off, as it were, even if they're only in their startup stage or they're working part time, as I say. Um, and that equality is not just about women. We've talked before, flexibility is not just about women, it's about carers, people who choose to only work part time, because the people are allowed to choose not to work five days a week. It is a choice in life. I'm still struggling with that one. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying people. So 
number one thing we do is increase the quality. Uh, number two thing that we've proven that we do is impre increase people's motivation. And let's face it, your motivation is your key driver to productivity. And if your team or yourself are not motivated, well, nothing gets done, does it? So we know from our conversations with research people, we help their motivation, their sense of well-being, you know, to turn off the computer, go home, get work-life balance, um, feel part of something much bigger than themselves. And the third thing that we do is help people make social impact. By creating a container, the melting pot is a container, by creating that physical space where lots of different people can come in and work, to work alone, have interactions, get inputs, get some ideas, those were water cooler moments. They uh, also build collaborative projects together. It makes social impact happen. So I'm saying these three things because what I want you to go away with, if there's nothing else, is as you're thinking about flexible working and remote working as a form of attracting staff, developing staff and retaining staff, in order that you can meet your organizational goals and be productive, I'd like you to really think about how co-working hubs, good ones, don't just find an office that just says we do co-working, find a good co-working hub to be one of the tools in your toolbox as an employer. If you want to uh, have the loyalty of a team that is struggling as we all are with um, these new technologies, you know, I'm on the phone, I'm, which, which communication channel am I on for this meeting? Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. An office is a really important place for you uh, and your teams to be productive because offices are not just about sitting down at a desk, they're collaboration spaces. They're, it's where you can smell somebody. I, I know we don't really want to smell somebody, but it actually matters that we are in a room with people without a mask and all that stuff, it matters. Um, why does an office matter? It matters for team cohesion. It matters for your work output. It matters to create innovation. It matters for creativity, for sparking ideas, for just thinking things aloud. It matters, offices matter because they maintain social relationships and for all of the unplanned interactions that can happen there. If we throw out the office with your new found flexible remote working, um, the negative effects of that long term are sustained business decline in performance, um, uh, loss of employee engagement, and therefore damages to your organizational health. We know that people want to work more flexibly, and some people are happy to work remotely, not everybody. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Think more carefully about the, the suite of tools that you put in place to support your employees. If we think about, I encourage you to think about your teams, but if I think about my team, I've got freelancers, I've got, uh, self, um, I've got young people on jobs, and I've got uh, more mature people working through their careers. So people at very different ages and stages in life. I had a, an interesting experience. This is just to denote, I suppose the point that I want to start with is that particularly younger people coming into work, and that might be a new person coming into your team, how do you onboard them? How do you really get to know them and suss out where they are, if you're like where they are mentally, professionally, energetically, emotionally with working for you? Um, if you can't have that regular interaction time with them, and it's the soft stuff. The training young people um, doesn't happen in six months. It, it happens over three years. Uh, getting young people into work, building up their confidence, their skills, their expertise. In Edinburgh, I'm tangent, we've got a real big problem in Edinburgh with um, uh, youth unemployment, Jeff will back me up here, massive youth unemployment problem in Edinburgh because you've got lots of adults basically, older than 25, wanting to live and work in this city. Now that might change, but uh, how do we onboard young people and, and teach them about business, about operations, about life in a work context? How do we do that when they're working from home in a shared flat environment where there's three or four of them trying to work remotely, remotely and effectively, they're not 
working from home out of choice, often it's enforced. Particularly young people, uh, people living alone and people in caregiving situations want somewhere to go to work. Maybe that's not all the time, that's absolutely fine. I have the pleasure of having an office in my home. It's quiet, I can get on with things, I really quite like it. But there's times when I desperately want to be with my team and support them. So if we think about young people, if we think about new people coming into your organisation, um, it's this experiment of working from home is grand for a while. But think about the winter ahead and then the spring after that and then the summer and that's uh, that gradual erosion of people's uh, connectivity in the team, a sense of knowing what left hand and right hand are doing, that, um, yeah, that the interactions that actually help your organization to build and grow, those opportunities will become stilted and um, sporadic. We do need glue as organizations. We need glue with our team. We need flexibility. Remote working is fantastic. But I would like us to think about how, does, how can you use co-working as one of the tools in your toolbox, along with Slack, along with Zoom, along with your stand-up meetings, your, your different meetings scheduled over time. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much, Claire. That was brilliant. That's even more now to think about. Um, and I love the way you introduced the, the idea of winter, which I think is, is is not where anybody wants to be going just now, but a real reality of, of, of what we have to think about um, going ahead. So it's just going to open now to um, questions for the panel. We've got one question here already from Yvonne um, asking, for what are people, what is the panel's thoughts on a four day week? Does anybody in the panel want to, to give that one a go? Yeah, great question, uh, Yvonne. Thank you for that four day working week. I think there's, well, there's a whole movement, isn't there, that advocates for um, four day working week. Like New Economics Foundation down in London uh, has done a lot of research into it and talks about it a lot. I and mean, I think the kind of theory behind that and, you know, why people are keen on it. I mean, before you work on it, it sounds great. But on the flip side, I wonder if that takes away a bit of control from some people. I think for me, the the really great thing about flexible working, you know, on on the whole, is that it's about control and giving people a bit more control and autonomy over where, when, and how long they work. Um, and I think it very much depends, I think that might, that's going to be a slow burn with business because I think it very much depends on the business sector, business type and what you're doing. That said, there's a really nice example, apologies if you've heard me talk about this before, a really nice example of the four day working week um, by a Glasgow based company called Pursuit Marketing. And in 2016, they had realised that some of their uh, part time workers were actually more productive than their full time workers. So they trialled a four day working week. Um, that's still a reality now. Everyone's on the same pay as they were on five days. They've got the option to come in and earn more commission on five days, but um, they've consistently, their productivity across the organisation has increased by 29% on four days. So it's a really interesting example from that sector um, when you're looking at productivity in the four day week. For me, I think that's a, it's a slower burn personally. I feel like there's a bigger step to overcome for businesses now to even implement very basic flexible working, so small adjustments to start and finish times, actually looking at why people might want to be or why they might be needing to work differently, as opposed to that fully kind of fledged four day working week across the board. I personally feel like we're a long way away from that, but I like the fact that people are researching that and the longer term societal change and shift, really investigating why do we have this five day, you know, where did that come from? We all know the industrial times and it was like how we worked. Uh, before nine to five at work, but but now we know that isn't the way things work. For me, four days just now, that's a, it's a long way off. I would like to see some, you know, more smaller and more step by step sea change and flexibility more generally that would benefit, you know, the majority of us around the world. I was going to say in Scotland, but around the world. So that's some initial thoughts for me. Thanks, Lisa. Anybody else want to come in on the, the idea of the four day week? Can I have a three-day week? I don't want to work. 
So inside, yeah. it's, it comes back to your outputs, doesn't it? Or your outcomes. What do you want to achieve and how long is it going to take to get there? And I think if we can uh, support ourselves to be healthier and more productive, actually it isn't about the number of hours that you chuck at something. We've got far too much um, cultural conditioning for the never-ending giving rather than the very focused, refined, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to do this stuff. Too many opportunities to do too many other things. Okay. Um, we've got another question here. Janice has mentioned about the, the importance and the need for maintaining um, uh, social connections within the team. So does anyone have any tips on how to maintain this, given how busy everybody is with the various demands of work? Uh, one of the things that we've looked, well, we have had uh, during furlough that we didn't have, sorry, during during uh, uh, lockdown that we didn't have uh, pre-COVID uh, was we've, we've made more use of MS teams uh, around about uh, rather routine call, you know, setting up a weekly call. That doesn't have to be hugely long, so and we've kept that going. So we, we had that during during lockdown, and we've kept that going even when people have returned uh, to to the workplace and in, in, in different uh, shapes and forms. So that, that that that's been very helpful, and and also to share the load on that. So it's it's not just the same person that shares that every week. So it rotates around the team, and it means you get a different mm -hmm. flavour to that and that, that enables people who are uh, working uh, flexibly in, in location, working remotely, uh, working various hours. And we, we, we also uh, can, can record that as well so that if somebody's missed out or they've, they've they had to be at, at a place of work at that time, they can, they can look it after and you keep it live for a week and then you delete it and the new one comes up. So it's been quite handy doing that. That sounds like a great idea, and I can see Kim and Pauline's eyes lighting up. Look, the happy faces there at the thought of rotating the, the chair for that each week as well. <laughs> um, so, wait to see. We've got another question um, for yourself, Claire, um, from uh, our Claire. Um, have you been able to replicate any of the good practice idea sharing um, from the melting pot to an online working home environment? So for our customers, when we went into lockdown, we created something called the virtual pot. And it was to try and, it was a Slack group, um, and it was to try and give our customers uh, some of what they had in person uh, remotely. And that included um, new things that we'd never done before, but we, they were actually just starting some events we were doing about productivity. So there was a daily uh, productivity session, a focus group, that people could come in on and just help them right between 10 and uh, 11 or let's see 11 30 there is this group uh, team check-in productivity there's casual chat channels uh, we've got pandemic baking and the great outdoors uh, water cooler moment chats uh, as well as informative uh, slack channel that's you know work related share or funding opportunities uh, requests for help so we, we did create a, a virtual uh, forum for that. But I'd say, I mean, to some people it's been highly successful, um, but you know, w w people's work situation either went quiet, trickled along, disappeared, went boom. You know, it's a crazy, it's been a crazy seven months for people. And um, some people have wanted to engage in that channel uh, for, for their own personal reasons and others haven't. One of the things that I actually forgot to say that I'd like to share in my presentation was about types of people. And when you're thinking about your team, that either current or future, is about the types of people they are. I have realised uh, during lockdown that I am a very happy introvert, which is quite surprising because I'm also extremely sociable. And it can be quite confusing. And so there must be other people out there uh, the, the extroverts are dying on the vine working from home. They are, you know, shriveling up and uh, getting frustrated and it's killing them. Whereas introverts go, oh, that's very nice, that's peaceful, it's lovely. Um, so I'd really encourage you to think about your teams 
not just in terms of how you can get them together, but who basically needs social interaction and who really would actually rather have the quiet workspace. Thank you very much. And whatever office environment that you create in the future, however you do do your collaboration, your, you know, your, your work hub, uh, have a think about those different um, introvert, extrovert types in the pipeline, not just for the personality type, but the type of um, forums, the, the type of things that you want to get out. Is it q and Is it um, a brainstorming session? You can do these in different ways. I, I forgot to mention that. That's a really good point. Thank you, Claire. Who's dying on the vine working from home? Come on, hands up. Who's, who's hating it? Two people. Everyone else loving it? Hands up if you're loving it. Double hands. Why are you loving it? What, what are you loving about working from home? Nope. Nobody's going to commit anything there in case they feel differently tomorrow. <laughs> Someone's got a point there. Who's that? Janice. Yeah, I've worked from home for the last 15 years um, and I started working from home when my family was reasonably young and it really, really suited me and I got into the swing of it. So actually it suits, it suits me very, very well because I'm used to it and in that routine. However, I think this, you have a social disconnect, you know, so, and I take on board your uh, comment there, Claire, about personality types because I would say I'm an introvert. But I think there is the, what's the right word? Sometimes you have to be aware as well that you can be become isolated from that social connection as well because you're an introverted person. So, you know, it's about that balance of connection um, and if it works for you. But yeah, I mean, I've done it for years and it, work, it suits my personality type, I guess. Thanks, Janice. So hold on, we've got a question here from um, Petra. Um, so around physical space, so a practical question, you're in the middle of taking on your first physical space and want to co-share with some other organisations, but is it a bit insane with a potential second lockdown around the corner? That is, it's a direct but a good question. Does anybody have any thoughts or um, points or that they would like to share with Petra? I think it's a great question, Petra. I think everyone, whether you've got an office yet or you don't have an office yet, everyone's thinking about how they're going to be using that space in the future. And certainly for the short to medium term, offices aren't going to be used in the same way as before because we need to have those like the physical distancing measures in place. So the organisations that we're talking to are thinking about using them, more as Claire's talking about, it's kind of collaboration hubs. So it's not offices with rows of desks as they were before, but a place for people to perhaps more occasionally come together to have like the kind of team um, brainstorming sessions or collaboration on a certain project and then everyone kind of goes away and works away in that and then comes back for certain things as opposed to a place that everyone comes into every day. So I, I, I yes, I'm an advocate of flexible working, but I personally love being together with my team as well. I think it's all about balance. So I think having a space for people to come together and collaborate as long as you can make it financially stack up um, is, is always a good Thing. I guess it's all it's about how you can balance it against your finances for me thinking about running my own social business and for the finances stacking up. So. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, right, we've just hit four o'clock, but I think Sue, you had a your hand up to ask a question that you wanted to, to ask just now. No, it was much more a comment actually. It was about um, whether you enjoyed working from home and I suppose in the situation I am which is in a really rural location it allows you to live where you want to and um, and continue working so you know there's enormous uh, enormous possibilities there but I thought it was interesting Claire when you were talking about you know organizations that don't have a physical collaboration space and what happens to them longer term and I wonder what that means for rural organizations where people might be working from all over Scotland and only get together very minimally, really. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I've been reading research that's been done on um, studies on uh, projected studies on workplace productivity, whether people get together or they don't get together, and innovation. Um, I think depending on who who's commissioned the piece of work might tell you what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. Is there a bias towards an office or is there not? 
Um, I think I think um, Sarah made an interesting point there. I think was it in Sarah in the chat function that talks yeah. about she's worked from home from a long time, but actually spend communication better because everyone else is working from home now. And I think that's true of a lot of people say I think that's right because everyone's in the same boat, so no one is left out. I think part of the problem before of people who are working part time or working not always in the space, they might get you know, not even on purpose would get overseen for certain things, whether it's a piece of work or, you know, drinks on a Friday or whatever it might be, and someone might not be working on a Friday. So I think that makes it, it's, it's kind of made a bit more of an even, an even playing field for everyone, because we've all had to experience the same thing at the same time. So I think that's a really, really good point, Sarah. Okay. Well, listen, that's us just over our time. So I'm aware people have plenty of other things to go and go on with. Well, um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I think your input has, has been absolutely brilliant and just given so much to think about. Um, what we will do is we'll share, we can share the recording with the folk who are here. So if you want to then pass that on to other colleagues, um, you're very welcome to do so. And what we'll do is, I know there's not been a scope for to have a, a more of a discussion around it, but if there is an appetite um, amongst SEN members to come together and talk about some of this and share ideas, run different things past one another, um, we can certainly um, put on a session. Um, with that kind of format. So thank you very much, everybody, and um, hope to see you all soon. And the technology held out for the full hour and three minutes. Thank I'm you. so pleased. <laughs> okay, thank you Aww, very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.